everybody, thank you for joining me for today's introduction and kickoff of this webinar series called Grand Rounds. Today, what I'm gonna focus on is more a general concept of what we're gonna be presenting over the next several months and into next year, we'll have specific webinars and I will introduce the ones that we currently have scheduled as we go, as I introduce you to the various concepts that we'd like to cover. Today, what I'd like to cover is the value of assessments, maximizing efficiency, reducing risk and improving outcomes. So the first thing I'd like to do is to first set the stage as to what I mean by an assessment. Because as you all know, that assessment begins as soon as you are introduced to the client or patient. You're going to hear me use patient a lot because I come from a medical psych background. So forgive me if that's uh, uh, unsettling for any of you. But what we're talking about today is not the kind of assessment that you do on a regular basis as far as observing your patient's affect, observing how, the language they use, how they introduce themselves, how they interact with you and your staff. That is an ongoing assessment process that we all do and is a very, very, very valuable part of the process. But today we're going to talk about the type of assessments that are standardized. These are the ones that have standard data that is gathered from a population that the test is designed to be used with and that research has been done to prove their, their reliability and their validity. So those are the type of a formal assessments that I'm talking about today. So the first thing I'd like to do is ask a few questions and have you fill out a couple survey items just to kind of get an idea of where assessments fit in your practice. So if we can launch that survey, you'll be able to make your selections on the screen in real time. We'll give you a few minutes to do that. Okay, Sherry, do we have our results? Should we give them a little more time? Dr. Williams, you'll want to click on this, the survey tab to see the results. Got it. Thank you very much. So it looks like about 50% of them use them with every client. That is awesome because that is what we're seeing in the trends today. And I'm going to talk a little bit more of that in a second. All right. They're changing a little bit. Now we're down to 41%. Most clients, 25%. Very good. This, this, this completely makes sense because what I'd like to talk about next is there was a huge decline. And I think, I think most of you realize this or experienced this back uh, over the past, say, 20, 30 years, there's a huge decline in psychological assessment. And that happened for a variety of reasons. Some of those reasons <clears throat> include inadequate training in the administration and interpretation of tests. I was in a, a demonstration or presentation by Joseph Ben Porath, the author of the MMPI-3, and he it confirmed that many training programs are not teaching specific assessments in their coursework these days, which would obviously uh, result in a decline in the use of assessments. Also, indiscriminate administration of large test batteries. This, this day of throwing the kitchen sink at every patient we see is over and probably never should have really happened because it's irresponsible. We really want our testing to be focused on what the question is, what are you trying to learn, and how is that contributing to the treatment of that individual or the understanding of that individual to better uh, their quality of their life. Also, we saw, saw a rush in mechanical interviewing to where testing in a way became a surrogate for interviewing, which is a shame because good clinical interviews are very valuable and we get a lot of great information from those. Over-reliance on generic computer-generated reports. Now, I take this one a little personal because back in the day when I was research director, I wrote the logic and the interpretive 
um, statements for these reports or so, some of these reports, like the Wisp, the Waste, the Whipsy, and the like. And they never were intended to be a be all end all report. This was not intended to be printed and then boom, here's my report. They really are only intended to be a jumping off point, a place where you can now go in and put your insights, your observations, your knowledge of their past quotes from their teacher and things like that that can really help to bring it into a personalized instead of just based on uh, data from an assessment. Also limited discussion with results with clients and this started happening a lot back then where the results were, yeah, shared with whoever was asking for the assessment, but the results weren't being shared with the patients. And that's a very important part of the whole process is that these should be, we're gonna talk about how this enhances the patient's knowledge of themselves and of what's going on in their life. Poor reimbursement schedules. Now you all can relate to this one, and this is still going on today, especially in this environment. We've had some, some nice adjustments by our third-party payers in the COVID times where uh, telehealth is being reimbursed at some level at least and being accepted. And we're hoping that with increased knowledge and maybe training of these decision makers who are creating these reimbursement schedules, that this kind of information we're talking about today will eventually get to their ears and they can understand that uh, these assessments do truly increase outcomes, improve outcomes. So this next part, of, when I talk about assessments, especially uh, standardized assessments, this might be a little surprising because, you know, I've worked with Dr. Uh, Mira Lezak at Oregon Health Sciences University. I've worked with Dr. Gail Roy, who's my mentor, and he's the author of the Stanford May 5. So it might come a little bit of a shock that I have a love-hate relationship with assessments. And I think as we go through these, most of these you probably share with me. One thing I love about assessments is when they're used to measure what they're designed to measure. Assessments are designed to measure a population and a construct. And when they're used to measure that construct in that way, according to that theory, and with that population, they're very valuable. When they're not, they're often, often misinterpreted or misused. You're gonna get misinformation if you're using it outside what the test was designed to measure and with a the population they weren't designed in the first place to measure. Another thing I love is I love it when it informed a specific question. Like I mentioned earlier, there's, there are specific questions that are being asked by a school, by a loved one, by the patient themselves, by an organization, by a court, and they're asking for a specific piece of information about a specific construct or issue. And assessments can be used very well to do that. And when they're done that way, used that way, I love it. But when they're done, <clears throat> when they're applied willy-nilly, yeah, I use the word willy-nilly. I think we should bring that word back. I like that word. It's a fun word. Then they're oftentimes going to be misrepresented. They're, it's going to be overused, overuse of resources. It's not going to apply to what the given problem and issue is. So therefore, it's really not going to contribute to the end result and quality of life of the individual. I love when they're used therapeutically. I'm sure you've heard of therapeutic assessment. If not, take a look at some work by Steve Finn, some great work on therapeutic assessment and how assessments contribute to the therapy process and a, a better outcome. I hate it when they, can, they create confusion. When, where, and how to communicate test results to a given patient, to, to an individual, is really your gut instinct, your training, your ability to know how to communicate this information. If it's just a, a download of all this information, it can be very confusing. And it can be, can, can be a setback rather than a, 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 a help. So being careful with how this information is disseminated, not that it shouldn't be, just how you do it is a skill and something to be practiced and thought through. I love it when they have strong psychometric properties. If you're using an assessment that has weak psychometric properties, using it qualitatively, okay, that's, that's up to you as far as just the using the pieces of information to help build the puzzle of what you're working with. But without strong psychometric properties, you really don't know what that score represents. Who does it represent? What theory is behind it? And what population should I, should I use it with? And what construct are you actually measuring? Uh, and that's important. And that's what strong psychometric properties give us. When they have weak or no psychometric properties, it's really easy to put too much emphasis on that assessment, and then therefore it's being misused. Uh, and it's overriding some of your, your best therapeutic assumptions, your gut instinct uh, is very important. I hate it when they're using isolation to make a decision. We're all 
preach this, and this is drilled into us all through grad school, that one test result used in isolation is not enough. We really do want to have a litany of information that all points in certain directions. Where it doesn't fit is a gut check, and that's when you need to do, do more digging. That's another good uh, uh, benefit of assessments. Neutrality makes disclosure more likely. And we'll talk a little bit more about this a little later, but it's, it's difficult to disclose personal information, hurtful information, scary information, embarrassing information uh, to another human being. The neutrality of an assessment, looking at a screen, reading questions off a screen, filling out a questionnaire, is a lot more likely to get that information that is going to take time and rapport and use up resources in order to get to it uh, in other ways. So I love how our assessments give us that. And I love it when it's used to support a good sound clinical judgment. And they said, that is where everything starts and ends. Everything feeds into your good clinical judgment and your training and your knowledge. It never should substitute a good clinical interview, period. And there were times, like I said, in the past where this was happening. It should never happen. And it's not using assessments in a way that is, that is useful. So let's jump into how assessments contribute to efficiency, reducing risk, and improving outcomes. Let's start with efficiency because now that's, that's one area that I don't think we give assessments enough credit for, is helping us be more efficient. In a way, you hear people say that it's actually creating more, more time. It's actually taking more of my time when I use assessments. But if you really dig into what assessments, what the potential of assessments are, you really do get a sense that they do contribute to efficiency. Let me talk a little bit about that. And I, I love this image because this image represents the complexity of the individuals that come to you. Just, just the human experience in general is very complex. It's got lots of winds and turns and valleys and dead ends of a lot of different things that have happened to this person as they've grown and developed uh, their cognitive schemas and their behaviors and their belief systems. It becomes very complicated. And one thing that assessments can do is help us to, is to get that expedite that routine data collection. Now, don't take me wrong. I, I don't mean routine as far as not important. All of this information is, is important. Background history, their support system, any trauma in their past, belief systems, things like that are all part of the complexity of this. And, but some of that information can be gathered routinely, taking very, very little of, of your time. So some of those routine data collection looks like biopsychosocial history forms that can be filled out uh, at, at home, at their leisure, they could take their time, give the information you need. It took very little time out of, out of your day in order to assign this um, digital assessment to them remotely. And yet you've got a wealth of information that the assessment has organized for you and put into a nice, clear picture so you can understand what the patient is telling you from that experience. Symptom checklists. Any given time, a patient has a lot of difficulty telling you more than maybe one, two, three things max if they're complicated because the mind just can't think of that many things at one time, especially when you're hurting. Anytime somebody's experiencing extreme emotional distress, their memory gets foggy, they have a hard time recalling information. So at one given time, you're, you're probably only gonna get one or two problems talked about. By giving them a symptom checklist, you're giving them the opportunity to say, oh yeah, yep, yep, I'm experiencing that. Yep, I'm experiencing that. So you're gonna get a lot more information with very little time on, uh, 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 that you've spent on the process. Personality inventories. What am I dealing with here? Is this somebody that is out of, out of my, uh, uh, my ability to treat or is this somebody well within my wheelhouse? How is this personality, this personality type that I'm dealing with here, how is it gonna affect the course of treatment? And we're gonna, we're gonna speak to that one a little bit more later. Quality of life measures, I think, are highly underused right now. Because the bottom line to me is a person that has really, really low quality of life is highly, highly susceptible to relapse and, and, and also to just treatment difficulty. The progress is going to be very difficult to make if their quality of life does not improve. So understanding what their current quality of life is and then monitoring that throughout the process, I feel is very, very important. Remote administrations these days is, is becoming obviously very, very important, especially in this environment 
with this new normal and telepractice becoming much more important because we're just overwhelmed. There's just not enough resources out there. So remote administration is a great tool to use to improve your efficiency. Another thing that affects efficiency is full disclosure issues. Now, this is the the, the best euphemism I can come up with. I didn't want to I didn't want to say liar liar pants on fire because that's just kind of mean, and I'm saying that in jest. But it, it, patients do come to us with difficulty disclosing issues, and there's a lot of reasons why that. So full disclosure issues, or AKA validity, are common in our practice, and it's not that they're necessarily doing it always on purpose. So there's, sometimes they're just unwilling or unable to share the facts. Now, this could be because of stigma, which I call the most dangerous disease in the world. Stigma has probably hurt and more people and destroyed more qualities of life than anything else that we know, any disease that we have. Because with stigma, you get that holding back. You don't want to share it. So you try to live through it, try to sit with it, and it just continues to, like a cancer, destroy your life. So stigma might be the, the reason they're unwilling. They may be lack of rapport. Rapport is not always easy. Again, based on personality and other character types, rapport can be a huge barrier to the efficiency of the treatment process. So assessments that can help you to, to understand where is that rapport and how to build that rapport and where we're at with the patient can be very helpful. Sometimes they're malingering. Maybe there's a good reason. Sometimes there's secondary gain to why they're malingering and why they're unwilling to share the facts with you because it is could be harmful. Memories of repressed repressed memories are harmful or dangerous. They, they create a lot of fear. <clears throat> and when somebody's got these, these repressed memories that are based on either a childhood experience, an adverse childhood experience, trauma, especially in today's world with all the trauma that's happening right now, um, repressed memories are a very important part. And you may not ever really get to, I, I like to use the analogy of you turn to look at a pond and you see ripples. Well, you don't need to have seen the rock hit the pond to know that something created the ripples. And that's what assessments can do. Assessments aren't necessarily going to get you to that, that event or get you to exactly what happened to traumatize the person, but it can give you ripples. So you see the ripples of that something's there that I need to pay attention to and be aware of. And then also they may be using strong, unhealthy defense mechanisms. And, and these will come into play all throughout the therapy process and the assessment process because these strong and healthy defense mechanisms could have been developed because of uh, trauma, uh, childhood, how they learned, things like this. So strong and healthy defense mechanisms are coming into play and we're going to talk more about that in a little while later. Another concept that helps us to be more efficient and assessments contribute to is clarity. Know what you're really getting yourself into. The more information I can gather up front or very soon on, I didn't do that. Um, the earlier I can get that information, the, the better I'm going to be able to prepare for what I'm working with. Know who you're really getting yourself into. Is this someone you can effectively treat? Now, we can't treat everybody. Now, this is something you may not be able to treat. And the earlier you can decide that, the, the better you're going to service that individual because if it, it's more efficient, obviously, to refer somebody to an individual who's a specialist at that group. Now, we can't treat everybody. So, it's in, so assessments can help us to make that decision early on so we don't abandon our patients and we make a, a, a very successful handoff to a individual who can efficiently treat them. What's the core concern? Kind of like that maze, or how do we get to that core concern? Now, there may be multiple concerns. Comorbidity is the rule, not the exception. But still, we need to know what is that core concern. A comprehensive picture always going to point to, all right, here's, here's the meat of this. Where do we go from here? That's important information. Comorbid concerns, like I just mentioned, are, like I said, the rule, not the exception. How many of them are we dealing with, and how are they reinforcing each other? Assessments can help us to understand that early on in the process. The degree of awareness. How sophisticated is this individual that I'm working with? How aware are they of what's going on in their life? Comparing the assessment results of what the patient is telling you and the story you're getting, that story is very important. But comparing that results to, to what the, the test results say 
helps you to kind of do a gut check on how sophisticated this patient is with what's going on in their life. It also is your gut check. It helps you as you're building your internal conceptualization, your, your hypothesis is always working. Assessment to help contribute to that awareness and kind of use it as a gut check. Cognitive ability, oftentimes overlooked when it comes to pl treatment planning, but knowing or just having an estimate of somebody's cognitive ability is very valuable at the very beginning. Am I going to start with with some insight oriented because this person is quite sophisticated, their cognitive ability can handle it? Or is it somebody I need to stay with a more of a cognitive behavior or just pure behavioral? If I think they're going to really struggle with anything that's a little too heavy for that for, for their ability. And again, never underestimate the gut check uh, ability of assessments. It helps you to understand, am I, am I on target? Is there any signs that I need to revisit some information and talk with the patient about uh, what's going on. The next subject that I'd like to talk about is it, that affects efficiency is emotional landmines. Now, forgive the, the metaphor. Um, if anybody has a better one, please shoot me an email. I would I'd really appreciate it, but I, uh, it's a little, little graphic, but it, 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 it fits because you know an emotional landmine when you step on it and it really disrupts treatment. In fact, you end up doing a lot of repair work when that landmine is uh, is ignited. And so what I mean by that is <clears throat> the trauma, loss, anger, fear, if there's landmines built up in there that when this subject is touched on or when you ask this question or when I talk about this, then it ignites a lot of fear, loss, anger, and it shuts people down. And so this is one of the subjects that we're going to be talking about in the, in the, in the near future. November 16th, Dr. Pat Moran is going to have a grand rounds and present some cases and some assessment information that helped with uh, these patients and how assessments can be used with complex trauma. And this will definitely help you to avoid the landmines that are created by these complex traumas. Maybe they're using unhealthy defense mechanisms, as I mentioned earlier. And, and these defense mechanisms are designed specifically to bury these mines, to keep them undetected. Because if it gets unearthed, if it comes to the surface, then it creates havoc. There are healthy ways to make peace with that, but if you don't know it's there, you can't work on that. So repression, denial, projection, reaction formation, et cetera, these are things that are unhealthily used to keep these night mines down, but they are inefficient and they take a lot of energy away from the individual's ability to recover. So knowing about them ahead of time, working on uh, helping them to identify them and then helping them how to make peace with them is uh, an important part of that process. And what are their attitudes toward treatment? The whole you may, you may be spinning your wheels and things are not progressing like you think it should be, but lo and behold, this person doesn't like you, doesn't like psychologists, doesn't want to get better. They feel like the whole process is, is, is hokey pokey. And if you knew that up front, wouldn't that be a good place to start? And so there's another, another one of those landmines that's often overlooked is the person's attitude toward you. And just resistance to change. Uh, change is hard. Change hurts. Change is not fun. It disrupts a whole ecosystem and dynamic around you. And everything about that ecosystem and dynamic is built to force you back into order. This is where you are supposed to behave. This is what we expect you to do. This is where you belong. So resistance to change isn't always just that they don't want to change. It's the system around them won't let them change even if they wanted to. So it's hard. So understanding their attitude around change and the, and the system around them, how, how that works, that dynamic can be very, very valuable information. Next thing is prioritization. First things first, where, where do we start? And assessments can help you figure that out. We talked about what's core, but where do we start? Let's talk just a little bit about how to prioritize, how assessments can help us prioritize treatment. I always, I always hear this statement, start where the patient is. <clears throat> and I put question marks behind that because I'm not so sure that's always the best place to start. Patients don't always know what's best for them. That's why they're coming to you. Yes, we want to hear where they want to start. We want to hear about what's going on in their life and what their priorities are and where they want their life to go. What does a quality of life look like to them? Yes, that's very important, but start where they are. I have some doubts about that at times. Like for example, what if they're swallowing a heavy dose of anger, but they present with depression? Where are you going to start? Well, one of my uh, 
uh, old the psychoanalytic professors, Dr. Caldwell says, you can't spit and swallow at the same time. So maybe where this patient needs to start is how they can begin to spit out this anger in a healthy manner. Right now it's expressing itself as depression. How do we get them to accepting that anger and, and finding out how they can express that anger in a healthy way? You'll see the depression go away. There's another follow-up to this that I'll mention in just a second when we get to it. Repressing trauma and un unable to fully express or discuss. Like I said, you see those ripples in the water. You, you, you know that that trauma is likely there. You may not know exactly the nature of it, but you see the ripples and maybe that's where we need to start with. How do we get to uh, their past? Uh, the adverse childhood uh, experiences might be the place to go. So that is another part of uh, starting with the patient or not. Maybe they're in trouble and they're keeping unhealthy secrets. So if you have a report over here, you know, they just got out of juvie or they just got out of jail and they're not talking to them about that. Why? Maybe because they're still in trouble and they're, they're keeping these unhealthy secrets and that's going to prevent you from getting to what where they really should be working on uh, in, in their treatment. Risk. We all agree that when, when, we, when we detect risk, we treat it there. We start there. It doesn't matter where the patient wants to start at that point. It's risk is the most important thing. We have to talk about your safety. That, that is, a, is a given. Through a diagnostic picture, it's, it's good to know what before you schedule and plan for the how. So having that thorough, that clarity, that diagnostic picture is very important, and that's going to help guide. And if you're doing the therapeutic assessment approach and you're covering and talking to your patients about the results, that is going to help start where the patient is because it's probably gonna help change their mind or, or bring awareness uh, into their being so that they can see, okay, I think maybe we should start there. That uh, sounds like a good place to start. So this is this, this collaboration uh, that we work through. And then sometimes if you have that, that attitude toward therapy, they don't like you, they don't wanna be there, uh, they don't think it's gonna be helpful, uh, that maybe using, it's good to start with the low hanging fruit. It's, it's something easy, an easy win. Find something that, yes, is contributing to the overall problem, but is a relatively simple win to get this person moving forward. They see that and they feel that. Their quality of life goes up a little bit that you're measuring and tracking. And then all of a sudden they're like, okay, now what's next? They, they, they want to bite off more. And so that can help with that. Uh, assessments can help with deciding what that might be and where that, where that is. Progress monitoring. And I'm sure most of you already do this. This is, this is so imp important. Um, doing it officially at times is, is a good gut check, as I've mentioned many times. And you're also doing this unofficially. You're asking them, how are things going this week? And I want to 10. Those are all great check-ins. But an official assessment every once in a while can give us that, okay, is me and the patient moving together in the same direction, but the assessment's telling me something's still wrong. Something's still not quite adding up. And so that's where progress monitoring with an official assessment or a standardized assessment would be very valuable. So let me summarize that real quick. Expediting routine data collection, getting all that valuable information, but in a very short amount of time for you and let the patient put in the time, put in the effort. It's good for them. It's good for their recovery to be putting in the effort. Val validity, are, are you getting good quality, straight information or is there other things at play? Bring increased clarity to a complicated situation. Mitigate emotional landmines, keeping an eye out on those. Helping prioritize the plan of action and monitor progress and after plan. And that progress monitoring, you can always make a shift in your direction. That's very important as a collaborative relationship with the patient saying, you know what, I think we're gonna change uh, directions here a little bit because we're still having difficulty with this. So that's a good part of using assessments. Okay, let's start uh, talking about risk. There are a lot of different kinds of risk, and, and we always you know, we say that risk management is um, complicated, let's put it that way. Predicting the future is something that we as psychologists are asked to do all the time, and it's very difficult to use. Assessments can help, past behavior is a good indicator, obviously, but they're really, it's a very difficult thing to 
predict risk. But there's a lot of different kinds of risk. Let's talk about some of those. First of all, we're going to talk about the suicide risk. And especially in today's world, we're seeing a major uptick in suicide and suicide attempts. And that's it's super distressing and, and uh, very worrying. And this environment, it, it's no wonder. And we're being asked to do a lot more. And there's just so few resources. So the risk, the suicide risk is very complicated. I don't need to go through all these with you guys. But even bullying, you'd say, oh, because they're not in school right now, bullying has gone down. Well, well internet bullying uh, and social media bullying is still alive and well. Uh, and not having those other friends who are support available readily can make it even, even worse. So these things are still in play in the world around us, and we all know that. So this definitely is the place to start. We're always asking about suicide risk. And it is easier for patients to express fear of suicide or, or having our thoughts of suicide in an assessment than it is face-to-face, -face, especially at the very beginning where rapport hasn't really been completely established. So the other forms of risk, so self-harm, we've talked about. That's, that's, we're always going to put that at the top of the list. Substance use. Now, think about it. Not only do we have new substances that are now legal all over the country, but we also have people now who are staying at home. They're working from home. They don't have that time period where they're away from home. So now they have access uh, all day long. Even if they're working at home, working uh, remotely, they still have that continuous access and no monitoring. So what is that doing to substance use? What's that new normal? And Dr. Pat Moran on December 7th, my birthday, so please log in and say happy birthday, from 1 o'clock to 2 p.m. Eastern time, he's going to do a grand rounds on substance abuse and the new normal. So please tune in for that. It's going uh, to be great. The effects of past abuse. People who... We studied this in grad school, when we read about it in articles, and those who have been traumatized in the past, whether it be physical abuse, sexual abuse, they tend to have a pattern of putting themselves in risky situations. And that pattern is very dangerous, obviously, for re-traumatization. So getting that, that test results that says, I see the ripples in the water, something's important we need to talk about. And if it's the past abuse, ACEs, one of the most more common ones that we use, is an important piece of information because then you need to talk about and deal with that risk of continued uh, abuse and, and the behaviors that are putting themselves in uh, it, at, at risk. Risk to treatment success. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Beliefs, character, attitudes are a huge part of what can affect uh, the risk the risk of treatment failure most likely uh, is what that where that's going to uh, fall in lack of social support that scaffolding that is important to be built around the patient that helps them when the storm comes helps when things are falling apart who do you turn to where do you turn to what is available to you for support if the answer to that question is very very limited then they are at higher risk risk for relapse, risk for treatment failure, risk for self-harm. Because things like I said, are going to get worse before they get better. Treatment is dangerous. So knowing how much of that scaffolding is available, and if it's not, that might be a good place to start. Let's see if we can build up some scaffolding for this individual. Undiscovered comorbid conditions. We, we touched on this already, but again, this is a huge risk. That I didn't know about that, and boom, now, it's, uh, now we're doing repair because it, come in, it bit us. So be careful of that and understanding what that risk is. Another thing we don't talk about that much uh, is, is symptom replacement. It's a little bit of a psychoanalytic, psychodynamic um, concept, but I think it comes into play uh, just about everywhere where you have, you have this, especially when it comes to trauma uh, and things like the issues that are driven by this, this undercur undercurrents of trauma memories, trauma experiences, where you're expressing that that psychic energy is being expressed as depression, you treat the depression and you start showing because you're monitoring, you're showing that there is relief, when actually that that pressure, that energy is being expressed now as anxiety. So depression goes down, anxiety goes through the roof, irritability goes through the roof, things like that. So symptom replacement is something just to keep an eye on. So you're not always just want to focus on just the symptom of the, of the construct that we're working on, but be sure to throw in a little feelers out there for those common 
uh, moods and feelings that replace the one that you're you're focused on during treatment. And oh, and, and overall low quality of life. And, and I've said that several times, and I'll say it again. Quality of life is very important, and we all we all agree on that. But understanding your patient's quality of life and getting an idea of where they fall and being able to compare as you go through treatment is uh, is very valuable. Okay, so everything I just talked about contributes to quality, uh, to, to improved outcomes, correct? Uh, I think we'd all agree upon that. But let me, let me touch on this one just a little bit more uh, to, to, to bring some of those concepts together. Healthy self-awareness. <clears throat> Assessments and your feedback, interactions, your collaboration with your patient helps them to begin to build a healthy self-awareness. Now, that self-awareness might be that they're aware that they have a personality disorder. That might be that they're aware that they have a major depressive disorder that might turn into bipolar, they're not sure if they have a family history. That awareness might just be just a healthy acceptance and peace with, okay, I'm dealing with a mental health disorder. That's a healthy place to be. Because once you get there, you're able to change. You're able to move forward and, and, and get past it. But with, with a lack of self-awareness, why would you change? As uh, Jim Witt wrote here, as far as you know, things are what it is. You know, that's just how it is. What, something's wrong? Yeah. You know, so self-awareness is very, very valuable. And I'm sure you guys have seen this awareness wheel before, but I like it as a visual because it, it helps remind me just how complicated awareness is. Um, assumptions, beliefs, interpretation, thoughts, sensory data, observations. How, how do they interpret the world? And where are the distortions coming in, in, into them? What kind of facts do they, they buy into or believe that really may or may not be part of reality? Their behaviors, their statements, their plans, their promises. All of these things are part of healthy awareness. And just having awareness of one may not be healthy enough. The more awareness we get, the better off this person's going to respond uh, to treatment. Also, where to focus? We already talked about limits, where to start prioritizing. But assessments also help us to understand strengths and weaknesses. I, a funny anecdote, I uh, heard a story about Albert Einstein and somebody wrote that he was a terrible cook. And people go, well, who cares if he can cook? He can do the theory of relativity. Look at the math equations, he can just pop out of his head, being able to cook is probably not going to be something we're going to need to heal in treatment. <laughs> so, so there are going to be those weaknesses that are going to be completely overshadowed by strengths. There's going to be those weaknesses that are going to have to be dealt with, like poor social ability, poor communication. You just don't get along very well with people. Okay, that's probably something that's going to have to be dealt with. If they can't cook, okay, that's probably, probably not going to be a problem. Uh, just kidding. But it's important to know what those strengths are that we can utilize, that we can beef up in order to utilize in the treatment process, but also which one of those weaknesses are we really going to need to focus time on and where do we, which one do we start with? Another one is resiliency and something that I don't, I'm not sure we talk ab about enough. And resiliency is very valuable. I mean, utmost valuable when it comes to full recovery and being able to go through life taking the hits, you know, because hits are going to come, storms are going to happen. Things aren't always going to be smooth sailing. So resiliency, the level of resiliency in an individual is important information. For example, if I had a patient who comes in and I estimate their resilience to be quite high, I mean, wow, they really do have a good, healthy, sound uh, level of resiliency. And they're telling me that their life is falling apart that everything is, 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 is terrible and they just can't stand it. They're being overwhelmed. I would tend to put a lot of credence in that report because they have high resiliency, then something's breaking it down. And the converse is also true, that somebody comes in, I, I estimate it at low resiliency, and they're telling me that their world's falling apart. Same story. I'm probably going to look more at the resilience, the lack thereof of resiliency and how the world is probably tolerable if we can work on some of these resiliency factors. It's not that we're not going to address the report of their lives falling apart, but it just it gives you that information of where do I need to start with this individual and what what is really going on and, and what, how do I treat this person? 
another thing that, that I've gotten is personally in, in treatment when, I, when I've dealt with patients and shared with them test results, it's a sense of affirmation, this valid, they're like, oh, so this is depression, this is major depression, I'm not going crazy. This is something that can be known, therefore it can be treated. When it's unknown, it can't be treated. When it's not validated and it's not accepted as real, how can we treat it? But it's very affirming, validating to the patient to get that information. They may not necessarily, it might not be good news, but it's good in the sense that now we understand what it is, let's do something about it. And that, that, that affirming nature is very, very, very important to human psychological survival. And the next inoculation, and this is a topic that I like to talk about because I think it's a it's a uh, somewhat of a lost art in, in treatment, but also widely used by a, a, a lot of therapists. And that is, once you have a good understanding of what's going on with the individual, you've got you've got sound test results, you've got a real good working hypothesis, and you understand that this person has X, Y, or Z uh, issue. Inoculation is can be very important. For example, you've seen those, you've tested the ripples in the water. You know, mm, I think there's some there's some trauma in there. So the PTSD is looking very likely. Uh, this is a person that I'm probably not going to jump right in and asking them to tell me about the trauma. I'm probably going to want to inoc inoculate them a bit and say, okay, we're going to be talking about some subjects that are going to be very difficult to talk about. And you already know that, right? And they probably already have tried before. You know, they'll probably agree. It says, but let's not talk about those specifics right now. Let's talk about talking about it. Let's talk about what it's going to feel like. What happens when you think about it, when you talk about it? And then we're going to work on some relaxation techniques, some other methods in order to maintain a healthy response to talking about it. And then we're going to go from there. And the assessment results very much help you to understand where those inoculations are needed. So improving outcomes, do a quick little summary. Healthy self-awareness, very valuable, very important uh, uh, outcome. Identifying strengths and weaknesses. Where do I start? Which ones do I work on? Which ones actually can be overcome with the strengths? Resiliency, very important piece of information. And Seth Grossman is going to have a uh, a session on that coming up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the date in just a second. Objective validation, normalization, and demystifying what's going on in their life. Oftentimes, people are just re these. Most of these disorders don't just come on overnight, and all of a sudden they know they feel different and something's wrong. These things develop over years, oftentimes months at least, and so it just kind of creeps up, and they're like, "What is going on?" So this normalizing, demystifying what's happening in their life and validating it is very important. Use assessment to inform uh, inoculations, when inoculations are needed. Like a, a former uh, Surgeon General said, I, I think I mentioned it earlier, we know what works, we're just not doing enough of it. So again, I uh, just wanted to make Make sure I announce the upcoming sessions, Encouraging Resiliency and the Value of Personality Assessment with Seth Grossman. That's on this, uh, November 12th at 4 p.m. Eastern. Trauma and the Value of Assessments with uh, Dr. Pat Moran on November 16th from 1 to 2.30 Eastern. And Substance Use, A New Normal and How It Affects Mental Health Care with Dr. Pat Moran again on December 7th, my birthday. 1 to 2.30 p.m. With that, I'm going to open it up for questions comments okay if we have no questions please feel free to uh, give me a shout out if you would like to may have a question or have any thoughts on it. My email is paul.e.williams at pearson.com. Let me put that up here so you can write that down. And I would love to hear your dialogue and any thoughts and ideas you have about this subject. And we look forward to joining us in our future uh, Ground Round sessions. Thank you, everybody, for joining.